Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. It is time for us to dig into the word of the Lord. Just a couple of announcements as we get started. We can take it to the top. <clears throat> Events happening this week at Pentecostal Temple, Church of God in Christ. Thank God for active church. You can roll, roll. This Sunday, name tag Sunday. No more hey you. You're going to have a name tag. We'll be able to call you by name. And it's going to be party at PT, an entry into the life of Pentecostal Temple Church of God in Christ. Here our mission, here our vision, here how you can get plugged in. There'll be balloons, there'll be food, there'll be people. It's going to be a good time right after service. I would encourage everybody to be a part of it. Why? Because none of you have been, it, been in it before. You haven't been there. I haven't been there either. So let's all party together and have a great time. Mental health. So the kitchen, our young adult initiative is meeting April the 19th at 7 p.m. And the discussion is going to be mental health. The Bible says that we would prosper in all areas as our soul prospers. So let's be a part of that. April the 18th is our next watch prayer at 4 a.m. That's right, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. And then April the 26th, that's a Friday from 10 p.m. till about midnight. We're going to be seeking the face of the Lord. And uh, listen, we ought to always pray and not to faint. Missionary Circle. The last Tuesday this month, the missionaries are going to be in charge, bringing the word of the Lord. They're going to meet together in their uh, quarterly meeting, and then at 7 o'clock, they're going to be bringing the word in our Tuesday evening Bible study. So we want to be there to be a part of that. I ain't going to fuss at nobody tonight, but missionaries, I need you on out here. We're here for you. If you're grieving, you lost somebody, uh, if you are going through a crisis, please call the church office. Let us know, 734-722-3060. We want to stay in contact with you. That's what's taking place this week at Pentecostal Temple. But tonight we are digging into the word of the Lord. We're starting a new Bible study series that I am entitling How It's Done. How It's Done. When we talk about the faith and being a Christian, sometimes things can be uh, just overlooked, right? It's like you're saved, but man, how do I pray? How do I fast? How do I evangelize? How do I study the Bible? Very basic things that Christians should be doing, but a lot of Christians don't even know how to do some of these things. A lot of Christians don't even know what the gospel is. Ask them, what's the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Bible? People don't know. But can we really blame them if we haven't taught them? So that's why we're here to talk about how it's done. All right, so I want you to go ahead and share this video because it is time to dig into it. And uh, I want you to be a digital evangelist tonight. Let the saints know that it's time for the word of the Lord. Amen. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his court with praise. And I will say this is the day that the Lord to be 
talking about prayer points from the life of Mother E.J. Daphne. I've got a book in my hand called What It Means to Pray Through. Maybe we can uh, tighten up on one of these. What It Means to Pray Through, Mother E.J. Daphne. This is a powerful woman of God out of Philadelphia, a prayerful woman of God uh, who, um, hungry for more of the Lord, and you know about Mother Daphne, uh, she committed herself to three years of fasting and praying where she would go up to the church and fast and pray every single day for three years. Holidays, birthdays, it didn't matter. This woman sacrificed for the Lord, but the result of her sacrifice caused thousands of people to come to know Jesus Christ. And so she was a prayerful woman of God, an amazing woman of God, and I've read this book a couple of times. If you were to look at my copy, you see ink all over it. You know, you got to read it once just to say, wow. Then you got to read it again just to eat it and just to let it soak into you. And as I was reading the book, Spirit put in my spirit to do a lesson on the prayer lessons from the life of Mother E.J. Daphne. Now, some of these things I have spoken about before, and uh, some of this will be repeats, but it is good for us to be reminded and informed because one of the things that I want us to do as believers is to really up our prayer life. It's to up our prayer life. I said this a couple weeks ago that I want us to get to the point where we say, I got to spend at least an hour with God. Like, I, I got to to do it. Like, I don't, like, my life depends on it. That's the place that we want to get to. People know that they need to pray. People know that they should uh, see God's face, but there's often a disconnect between what you know you need to do and then how to practically get there. And so that's what we want to look at tonight, um, looking at the prayer life of Mother E.J. Dabney. Did we pray? Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to open up the word and to teach. I thank you for your word that says the memory of the righteous is blessed. So Father God, I thank you for this incredible woman of God. Though she is in glory, has left a record for us to learn from and to emulate. So Father God, help us to learn something tonight that we can apply to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. And amen. So, there are many saints throughout history, uh, different denominations, different faith traditions, um, who made it a habit of prayer, who wrote prayers, uh, people like uh, St. Patrick, church fathers like Athanasius, uh, Sister Teresa of Avila, just people throughout history who had a meditative life and spent time with God. And you can Google their prayers. Uh, They wrote a lot of prayers. They had a life of prayer. They wrote books and meditations. And we often talk of, you know, these historic figures and I wanted really to look at the life of uh, Mother E.J. Dabney because this is somebody from the 20th century. This is somebody uh, who comes from our faith tradition, Church of God in Christ, and she was a powerful woman of God. And often we can know so much about people from outside and not really know about our own and people who have come uh, through our ranks. And so I want to look at her life and see what we can glean from it. And if you don't have this book, I would encourage you to buy it. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You probably find it at uh, CogitPublishingHouse.net uh, as well. And I know that it would be a blessing to you. And so without a lot of introduction, I'm just going to jump into uh, prayer points that I observed from her life and her ministry. Which, which one is my tight camera so I can know which one I should look at? That's my tight. Okay, good, good, good. So I can get eye contact on you. All righty. I'm going to give you these points, and we're just going to unpack them and take this ride together, all right? 
So a lot of the observations that I'm making from the book are not things that Mother Dabney explicitly taught. So she didn't say, do this, do that for your prayer life. But it's something that's caught, which means you look at what she did and say, you know what? That's a good idea. I think I can emulate that and uh, put that in my life. All right, here's the first thing I'm going to give to you. And as I read these points, I'm going to give you some quotations from the book to guide us along. All right, here's, here's the first point in terms of our prayer life. Number one is build a family altar. Build a family altar. Here's what she says on page number seven of her book. Doubtlessly, some will ask about the construction of the family altar. Is it material, something which is concrete and movable, or is it invisible and abstract? Indeed, the altar is more or less an intangible thing. It is a treaty, promise, or a covenant between God and an individual to meet at a definite place and a definite time. It's page seven of what it means to pray through. So to build a family altar, this means let me have a space and a place where prayer happens. Let me have a space and a place where prayer happens. You have designated rooms in your home for all sorts of things. You got a room with a TV. You got a room with a kitchen. You got a room with a shower. Maybe you have a TV in, a, in the bedroom too. You need a space where you know, hey, I can go here and pray. Even if it's your porch, something within your home, something around your home needs to designate, this is where I go and meet the Lord. As you begin to have spaces and places where you go and meet the Lord, it begins to trigger the reminder to pray. Uh, you've heard of the Pavlov experiment where they hit the bell and the dog starts salivating because the dog has associated the bell sound with food. Well, we need to do that in the spirit. Is we need to have spaces and places where we know, hey, this is where I go and I begin to pray. This happened in the Bible. Many of the patriarchs, they built altars. They got stones and put them on top of each other to signify a place of remembrance of what God had done, a place of prayer and a place of worship. How much more are homes? I mean, you may go as far as to uh, take a page out of war room and have a, an actual room where this is where prayer happens. I think that's a beautiful thing to do. But what she's advocating for and teaching here is that we need to be in a space where we know this is a time and a designation for me to actually pray towards God. So say build a family altar. All right, next for prayer is pray daily for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Pray daily for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 talks about prayer for wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. God is the giver of all wisdom and the giver of all insight. And she talks about how she would pray this for her husband and the elder that worked along with them, that God would give them insight. Because let's be honest, if God knows everything, we need to tap into what God knows for everything that we're trying to do. God has secret wisdom that he wants to unleash if only we would ask it. I truly believe that the innovations that we see in our world are the result of God's level wisdom. Who knew we needed an iPad? You know what I'm saying? Like, what was a computer? Now we can't live without it. You know what I'm saying? These are God-level ideas. And God wants to give you innovative ideas as well. So pray daily for not wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Number three, pray for the church. It's in page 11 of the book. Page 11, she says, I sought the Lord daily for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be granted unto these two young men. We were very young. The pitfalls of zeal without knowledge beckoned us, but the Lord guided us and taught us not to clamor for offices, neither to desire high places. We humbled ourselves, and the Lord made a way. Many opportunities presented themselves. 
to run to and fro, but we refused and made home our choice. So she prayed for them as they were pastoring the church. Uh, So you ought to pray for your church. You ought to pray for your pastor. You ought to pray for those that assist the pastor. You ought to pray for the deacons, pray for the missionaries, pray for the elders. All right? Pray that God would use them and give them wisdom and knowledge. All right, number four, have consistency in prayer. Consistency in prayer. Consistency and set, uh, how how do I want to say it? Consistency over time is better than one day praying for a long time and then you don't pray again for a month. Page 11, she says, I sought the Lord daily. Daily. So we don't get to take vacations in prayer. Um, We don't get to bank prayer time for the future any more than you pray over your food once a week. They were joking one day. They said, do you pray over leftovers? (laughs) I say, it's a new meal, it's a new prayer. I don't know what happened in that fridge while I was asleep. <laughs> hmm? Your power done shut off and came back on. Your food done melted and refrozen. You don't even know it. Amen. Pray daily. Number five, meet the Lord in nature. Meet the Lord in nature. Page 15. He, she's talking about the Lord, he told me to meet him the next morning at Skoykill River at 7.30 o'clock. When we came to the place where a tree bent over the road, the Lord said, this is the place. I descended the hill and ran to the bank of the river. She's talking about how she first started meeting the Lord. The Lord called her to a place outside in nature. Page 55 says, one night I walked out to my prayer mountain. I conversed with the Lord. So she made it a habit of being out in nature, talking with the Lord. This is not a strange occurrence for saints of God. The most, one of the most famous scriptures, Psalm 23, says he, he leads me beside the still waters. Makes me lie down in green pastures, leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. The psalmist is talking about being out in nature and his soul being restored. Listen, y'all done complained about cold weather. Take you a flonase and going outside. (laughs) Man, God speaks through nature. Who knew a solar eclipse would get so many people talking? I mean, God speaks through nature. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens talk about his handiwork. There is no language, yet their voices are heard. So when you go out in nature, God will speak to you. When you go out in nature and you just hear the wind blowing and you just see animals, you just see birds just getting food. They ain't went to no grocery store. and they just, That should do something to you. That should awaken something in you. Jesus prayed in the garden. Mark chapter 14, 15. Jesus looked over the city and prayed. Matthew 23, verse 37 to 39. Jacob met God in nature, used the stone for a pillow, and saw the ladder coming down from Jacob's ladder. Ishmael cried to God outside, and God heard Ishmael crying. Paul went to a prayer meeting at the river. Now I got to find where that was. Yeah. I believe with Lydia. Acts chapter 16. So they prayed at the river, prayed at the mountain, prayed out in the grass, prayed in the city, prayed in the garden. You can pray to God outside. Uh, Chris Rice... Uh, singer, he has a song 
called Here in My Cathedral, where he talks about stained glass leaves kneeling in the soil. It's a beautiful song, but about meeting God in nature. All right, number six, employ the use of different prayer postures. Employ the use of different prayer postures. Uh, Number, I'm sorry, page 17. It says, I would sit down and pray. I kneeled until I wore all the skin off my knees on those hard floors. At times I was so worn in my body, I placed three chairs together and stretched out on them. All right, so... She sat down and prayed. She got on her knees and prayed. She laid across some chairs and prayed. So pick a posture and go for it. Kneel sometime. Stand sometime. Sit sometime. Lay down sometime. God knows I don't render many a prayer. Laying down. All right? Jesus knelt in prayer. You look at the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark chapter 14, 15. He knelt in prayer. Then Hebrews chapter 5 says that he stretched out in prayer. Luke says he was on his face in prayer. Enoch walked with God and then was not. So you can walk and pray, you can sit and pray, you can kneel and pray. You can lay down and pray. Just tell somebody, just pray. (laughs) We'll do another lesson on prayer postures because prayer postures attune your heart to getting tapped into God. All right, number seven. Couple prayer with mundane activities. Couple prayer with mundane activities. Page 17. Mother Dabney says, at times I crocheted and prayed. Isn't that beautiful? At times I crocheted and prayed. What activity or behavior doesn't require your full attention? What, what mindless behavior do you engage in that doesn't take heavy thought? For Mother Dabney, it was crocheting. For you, it may be something else. Maybe you didn't. I've talked about folding clothes. I've talked about uh, walking. You, know, you got to think much when you're walking. All right? You're doing chores. Uh, you can list the activities that you can couple with prayer. I mean, the activities are endless. That you don't have to use your mind a whole lot. You're changing your fish water. <laughs> you know, you pouring the kibble for the dog. You're walking the dog. While you walk in the dog, you ain't got to talk to the dog. You can talk to the Lord. Well, Fido, it's just me and you today. And uh, no, you can talk to the Lord. You know, you can maximize that time with God. As long, here's what she says. Verse 17, she says, I never permitted anything to interfere with my conversation with God which means you can do activities as long as it doesn't take your mind off of prayer. So some stuff is going to be difficult for you to do and try to pray. So you know whatever those things are. Uh, But maximize that. This is why I do a lot of prayer in the Holy Ghost. Because when I'm praying in the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. You don't know what you're saying, but you're building up your spirit. You're praying blessings unto God. So I could be driving and praying in the Holy Ghost. My mind is focused on the road, but my spirit is connected with God. If you have a commute to work, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back, you got an hour prayer time. Tell somebody, this is easier than we think. And that's my goal, is to show you, hey, this doesn't have to be complicated. We don't have to be bound by what we think.
prayer should look like or how it has looked in the lives of other people. All right? Let's keep on going. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Number eight, meet the Lord at church to pray. She prayed at the river, but then she actually pr- prayed at church too. God shows up at the house designated and sanctified for the purpose of worship. Y'all, don't let people try to run this game on you that the church building doesn't matter. I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm tired of hearing it. No, the building is not the body of Christ. We know that. Tell everybody we know that. But the sanctuary, the name sanctuary means safe place, haven. There's something special about showing up to the church because God meets us here in a unique way that we've set apart for meeting him. We, we know this in the natural, but we don't really catch this in the spirit. We know this in the natural. If you're married, you engage your spouse in the bedroom differently than you would at the restaurant. Like it's obvious because that's a safe space reserved and set apart for you and your spouse. How much more the Lord? I love to come into a place and it ain't no junk laying around. It ain't, it's, it's pews and lights and instruments and an altar It screams, hey, this is the place to worship. It's good to have a space to come and pray. When you come and pray with the saints, you gain strength. You gain strength. So whenever you can, gather at church uh, to pray. If you can't gather in, uh, make your home into a campus. Your, Your home is a branch of Pentecostal Temple. Do you know Pentecostal Temple is in Romulus? PT and in Ann Arbor. PT has got multiple locations in Inkster. We got a campus in Detroit. You got to start thinking, man, gathering people to pray, coming together to pray. Number nine, make the use of prayer shut in. Page 17 says, the 72 hours I fasted and remained in church. <clears throat> Excuse me. My husband and little son looked after my obligations to keep me from worrying. So she prayed for a long time. She did shut ins with the Lord. This is why we come late. This is why we come early. We about to do for a good all nighter. We about to do. Um, my first year of pastoring, we just celebrated nine years. I should have talked right, right there. I should have talked from that chair tonight. <laughs> my first year of pastoring, within the first couple months, I was so overwhelmed. I was so overwhelmed. Um, had my vision, had my mission, had stuff I wanted to do. But it was just like running against the wind. And I said, I'm going to shut in in the church. And we called three days. It started Sunday night. I don't know what I was thinking. Had church in the morning, had a vision night, and then as soon as service was over, went right into shut in. Oh, I wept and I wept before the Lord. <laughs> I don't know if I was sad. I don't know what was going on. That was just, <laughs> oh my God. I stayed in here for three days, washed up in the bathroom, took naps when I needed to take naps, because I needed something from God that natural stuff couldn't do. And sometimes you got to go extreme for the Lord. You got to go extreme for the Lord. That's why we come so early in the morning, to push past our flesh. That's why we come late at night pray into the next day, right? So make, Jesus was three days in the temple. His parents were trying to look for him. He's three days in the temple. 
reading the Bible, asking questions, engaging with the doctors of the law. And Jesus was doing that at 12. You want to stay youthful in ministry? You need to spend some elongated time with the Lord. All right, number 10. Now, this is going to seem a little counterintuitive, uh, but we're going to say it anyway. Number 10, don't allow prayer to be an excuse to abandon necessary daily tasks. So we want to pray, but don't use spiritual enterprises as an excuse for not taking care of the basics. Because there's some people that can be really, really spiritual and just lacking the basics. You can't be a prayer warrior and you don't pay your bills on time. Like you got the money, you're just not prioritizing. You're evangelizing everywhere, but you don't ever clean up. Here, here's what she says. She says, I did not pray, page 17, I did not pray and leave my home uncared for. I got up early each morning and performed my home duties. She says, I'm a prayer warrior, but I'm going to take care of my house too. Yep, I'm going to take care of my home. I'm going to take care of business. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to work while I'm at work. I'm going to take care of what I need to take care of. It's a shame that any business should look at the Christians as the worst employees. That's a shame. They don't come on time. They don't do their work. That, that's, you're representing God. You're representing yourself. You're representing your church. You should be at a higher, Minister Bantam talked about that Sunday, is that we're, we govern our, we are governed by a different set of principles. So we don't get to do like everybody else is doing. We don't get to steal from the job. We don't get to go to lunch and not clock out. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't get to do that. Right? So we can't use our spiritual practices as an excuse to abandon the task we should be doing. All right? This helping the saints tonight? All right, number 11. A radical prayer life will invite criticism from other believers. Page 17 and 18 of the book, it says, the people did not understand why I should devote so much time to church. These were not sinners, but they professed the same love of God I had. They did not want me to pray. Many times they would come to church and pull and shake me, trying to make me leave the prayer altar. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Don't you touch me while I'm praying. <laughs> Radical prayer life will invite criticism from other believers. Here's what happens. When you're engaged at a level of excellence, a radical level of whatever you're doing, what it does is it triggers the deficiency in other people. Whenever you see somebody that's operating at a level higher than you in any area, especially if they're younger than you, it will remind you quickly of your deficiency. But you have a choice to make. You can either let that reminder humble you and say, what can I learn from them so I can get to that level? Or you can let the jealousy and the envy be fostered and you start hating on what they're doing. You start hating on their level. Right? So whenever there's a person with a whole lot of criticism about anything, there's usually a deficiency they're trying to make up for. All right? So get radical for God. And, and don't, don't try to squelch somebody else's fire that's radical for God. Oh, they doing too, they doing too much. They doing too much. I'm, I'm going to just say this because we're here. Four in the morning. Why are they doing four in the morning? That's way too early. 
Tell somebody to level up. Come on. My brother would say, tighten up. You see, somebody at a certain level, man, they, man, they always dress nice. Who they think they are? They always dressed up. They always try, well, who they think they trying to be? It's like, no, don't do that. Just be like, hey, man, where you get them shoes from? That's kind of nice. Le- tell somebody to level up. Somebody's operating at a certain level of excellence. Man, see what they're doing and emulate it. Don't, don't hate on it. Repeat what they're doing. Be an effective copycat. If you do what they did, you'll get what they got. All right? So you get radical, it's going to invite criticism. All right, number 12. Prayer and the Word of God go together. Prayer and the Word of God go together. Page 19. She says, at 8 o'clock one morning, I went to church to read my Bible before my prayer hour. To read my Bible before my prayer hour. Reading the Word informs your prayer. Because the Word of God is the mind of God. And if you know God's Word, you can hit the target in prayer because you know what God has promised and what God has said. Uh, Page 27, she says, down in our souls, the hunger and thirst tells us that it's moving towards God's noon hour when we need to put aside everything and eat his word, eat much of it, eat until we are full, and then store away the fragments. We know it is the non, we know it is the noon hour. We can hear the songs of praises singing in the music room of our souls. All right, so she made time to seek the Lord in prayer and she made time for the word. If you have all word and no prayer, you will use the word like a butcher knife, trying to argue and make points and just, it's, you're, you're only using the word for offense instead of using the word for spiritual growth. But when you have the word and prayer, the Bible says the letter kill it, but the spirit makes alive. Prayer helps the word come alive in your heart. There's a lot of people who know the Bible who aren't even saved. Satan knows scripture. He said, the Bible says, Jesus, if you jump off this cliff. Satan, so it's not enough just to know the Bible. You need to have some lubrication through prayer so that the word actually becomes life-giving for you, all right? So um, use the Bible to influence your prayer time. Intersperse reading the Bible within your prayer time. All of this counts. All of this is time with the Lord. And if you got all prayer and no word, you'll get off. You'll be praying weird stuff and saying weird stuff. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not in the Bible. Having weird visions. Ain't nothing wrong with visions, but doesn't line up with the Word of God. Pray and the Word go together. Uh, number 13. Volume does not impact the efficacy of your prayer. Volume does not impact the efficacy of your prayer. Page 19. She says, I did not pray loud in the building. I never made unnecessary noise. And I trained our members to wait on the Lord in quietness. Page 23. It was not a loud, annoying sound. But each one prayed with one accord. Uh, Mother Dabney arrived at the church to pray on two occasions, she says. And to her dismay... (coughs) Uh, Threatening letters were demanding her to abandon the prayer meetings. One letter had the tone of a death threat and warned her that if she stepped off the trolley car Thursday morning, she would never pray again. She stated that there was nothing she did to disrupt other people or businesses around their church. Part of her assurance was that she did not pray loud. That's powerful. Now, she had passionate moments of prayer, but she had quiet, meditative times of prayer as well. So you can be loud in prayer and passionate, as it'll get there sometimes, 
but you can be quiet and meditative as well. As a matter of fact, longevity in your prayer is going to come through you praying calmly. It's hard to pray for two hours loud. You'd be good for the first, you know, settings back in the day, that first 30 minutes, I mean, hollering, screaming. Once that first hour passed, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, it'd be dry. Thank you, Jesus. Me the need, Lord. Okay, so if you, y'all know I'm telling the truth here. So you got to mix them both up. Most of my prayer is a whisper. Sometimes I don't hear myself. It's just, this is very, it's very quiet because the volume doesn't make the prayer powerful. And I think knowing this will help a lot more of us, especially those of us that preach the gospel and communicate the word, to be our authentic selves. You don't have to holler and scream if that's not you. You don't have to do that. Be your authentic self. Be be who you are, and authenticity is what's going to bring about the results. I was, uh, and this is not to celebrate myself, but I was praying for the opening of the last service at the AIM convention last year. And praise and worship was on fire. I mean, the music was, it was here. And I knew, I'm like, I'm not no hooper. I'm not about to get up here and put on the show just because I got a mic and a platform. As a matter of fact, I practiced my prayer before I got up there. Y'all may not think that's spiritual. I, did, I, I practiced, because I said, I'm not about to be up there just fumbling. I practiced what I was going to say. I prayed that prayer. I didn't try to be a wonder. I didn't try to prophesy. I just prayed that prayer. I prayed like I prayed. I didn't get a tune in my voice. It just wasn't that moment. But when I was done, I got a word of encouragement. In fact, it was Bishop Patrick Wooden. He looked at me and said, son, that was a good prayer. I felt good. I felt all right. <laughs> I felt all right. It just reminded me, and, and he doesn't even know the impact that it had. It just reminded me to be myself. And I'm encouraging you, man, you don't, you don't have to you don't have to try to pray like me. Amen. You don't have to mimic my tongues. That's not how you get it anyway. You don't have to, you don't have to be C.H. Mason. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to force, be yourself, and as you're being yourself, your unique voice will rise up. Uh, number 14. Maybe we'll end at 15, and then we'll do the next 15 next week. Uh, number 14, repeating prayers is a good practice. Page number 20 of the book, and then we'll line it up with the scripture. She says, this is the prayer I prayed each morning before I left home while I was under the covenant. She prayed the same prayer each morning before she left and went to prayer. She prayed daily. A new day calls for a new prayer. So even about things you may have prayed for yesterday, you could pray for that again today. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. That's a daily prayer. This day. It's a new morning, new mercies, new challenges, new opportunities. We need new strength. We need new gratitude. We need a fresh dose of God's presence. There's nothing wrong with repetitive prayer. Matthew 26, 42 through 46, Jesus had a repetitive prayer. Uh, verse 36, it says, he came to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. 
Verse 44, so he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So you can repeat a prayer. You can say it again. Look, what Jesus cautions against is you just kind of doing this rote repetition just to pass time, like the Pharisees. Or we're just saying these, these things over and over and over just to make sure we hit our quota. That's, that's what we're talking about. But you can pray, you can pray the same thing over and over again until you get a breakthrough. That's what Jesus did. Paul prayed repetitively. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 through 10. Three times he prayed for a thorn to be removed from his flesh. He said three times, but the response was, my grace is sufficient for you. All right? When you pray the same thing over and over, what you're doing is you're expressing dependency and desperation. You're showing the Lord that, God, I need you. I need you to come through. I need you to do. It doesn't mean you don't believe. You just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Praise the Lord. Thank God for those watching online. Blessings to you. Blessings to you. Number... 15, and we'll, we'll end it right here. People need to be taught how to pray. People need to be taught how to pray. Page 22 and 23 of the book, it says, By this time, many of our members had learned how to contact God in prayer. They were ready for battle. I trained our members to wait on the Lord in quietness. She taught them how to pray. That's what Jesus did. The disciple says, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. So parents, you teach your kids how to pray. Teachers, you disciple the masses. Teach them how to pray. What we're doing right now, we're giving you tools so that you too can pray. It's not enough to just work. You got to pray. All right, let's run through these 15. Um, for those that may just be tuning in, we are studying from what it means to pray through. Mother E.J. Dabney, you can find this on Amazon. You can find it at Kojic Publishing House. Dot net and order the book. It's a, uh, it's a simple read. It's about 100 pages, just a little over 100 pages. Um, it'll be a blessing to you. I've marked mine's up. I've marked it up. All right? What it means to pray through. All right, let's run through uh, these 15 again. Number one, build a family altar. That means to have a, a time and a place to pray. Prayer two, pray daily for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Number three, class. Uh-huh. Number four, have consistency in prayer. Number five, meet the Lord in nature. Number six. Mm -hmm. Number seven. Good. Number eight. Number nine. Number 10. Good. Number 11. That's right. Number 12. Prayer and the word of God go together. Number 13. Volume does not unpack the of your prayer. Number 14. And number 15. Amen? Amen? Here's what I want you to do as the music begins to play. I want you to look at this list of 15. I want you to go back and watch this. While you're driving, watch it. And just pray what you, what you hear. As I'm teaching on Build an Altar, 
Lord, thank you for a space to pray. God, thank you that my car is a sanctuary. My car is a branch of the prayer ministry of Pentecostal Temple. I am seeking you, Lord, in my vehicle. God, I'm praying to you like the Ethiopian eunuch prayed in his chariot. Lord, I'm seeking you in my chariot today. God, guide me, protect me, use me today. Just take that time to pray. Play the video. As you listen to it, pray the next thing. I'm talking on praying, pray daily for wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Just start praying, Lord, give me wisdom. Show me which way to go. Give me insight. This, this becomes your prayer companion. So you don't have to try to figure out what to pray. You can pray along with it. Listen, I'm telling you something that I do. I'm telling you something that works, that works in my life, that works for me. Father, I thank you uh, for this opportunity to teach how to pray. And thank you, God, for the example from Mother E.J. Dabney. Lord, I bless you for those now, God, that are examples of prayer. God, even those that have become known for prayer all over the world, God, let that blessing, that anointing fall upon us. God, help us to use our time wisely and to spend time in prayer with you. God, I thank you for a church that's praying for an hour a day. Lord, however they need to do it, whether it's all at once, whether it's in pieces, God, I thank you for a life of prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Can we just take the next 60 seconds and just begin to pray? Let's just meditate on what we've heard. Um, just take the next 60 seconds just to pray about your prayer life. Thank you, Lord. Seek your face in prayer. Come on, just 30 more seconds. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I give you praise, Lord. Praying for you, Sister Rosa. Praying for you. Mother Raquetta Owens, we're praying for you. Brother Betrayal. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. A praying church. A praying people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. My car is the sanctuary. My home is a sanctuary. I'm going deeper in prayer. In Jesus' name. And it is so. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's stand. Let's stop our hands and give God some praise. Hallelujah. For all nations and all people. If you're not saved, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Since the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. We want you today to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you want to know the Lord Jesus. Would you pray that prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, 
Forgive me for the wrong I've been and the wrong I've done. I want to be saved. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. All the saved people, clap your hands and give them praise. Hallelujah. We pray that prayer today. I want you to go ahead and text the word My PT Church to 55444. We want to connect with you. We want to walk this Christian walk with you. You have a family here in Inkster. You've got a church here that you can be a part of, that you can grow in, in the name of Jesus. By faith, we give God praise for the growth of this church and the growth of the kingdom of God, most importantly. We're going to take now this time to bless the Lord in our giving. Amen. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Were you blessed by the word tonight? Amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. We'll finish this out uh, next week on prayer. But we want to look at several things, how to pray, how to fast, how to read the Bible. Amen. How to study the Bible. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. How to evangelize, how to street preach, all of it. We digging in. Uh, yes. Thank you for your generosity. gift and the giver. Multiply our seed sown. Increase the fruit of our righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. This Sunday, following church, party at PT is going to be a good time. Name tag Sunday. We're going to know you by name. It's going to be a good time. Father, bless your people. Thank you for your words spoken today. I ask you, Lord God, you bless us as we leave this place. Never your presence. Keep our heart and mind stayed upon you is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. It shall be well with my mind and my body. It shall be well with my friends and my family. It shall be well with my finances. It shall be well with my church. It shall be well with my city. It shall be well with my nation. It shall be well with my planet. Because I am righteous, everything that concerns me shall be well in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday.